Thank you. Good afternoon. Since we are at a classical college, I thought we should start off just with a little bit of wisdom from Socrates. One of the things that Socrates tells us is that writing is a crutch for weak minds. We'd be better off just remembering things on our own. Of course, as I stand here in front of you and you're all staring at me, and I have no notes for my presentation, that could make a person a little bit nervous, but there is an ancient technique, given that memory is one of the five canons of rhetoric, there's an ancient technique for remembering things, and perhaps some of you are familiar. It's called the house of memory. So all I have to do is picture in my mind a house, and then I'll open up the door, and as I go inside there on the couch is the Book of Concord. I'm feeling very Lutheran already. <laughs> and the Book of Concord is left open on the couch, like someone's been reading it, maybe got up to get a refill of coffee, and soon we'll be back, but what's that right next to the couch on the end table? I see some numerals, three of them in fact, an eight, a zero, and another zero. And, and on the mantle, above the mantle, there's, there's a statue of Columbus above the mantle. What's that in the kitchen? It seems like the kitchen counter, in fact, the cupboards, everything, it's like transparent. I can see right through to the drain pipe and it goes down into the sewer. But wait, I'm hearing something, it's in the next room. A child is practicing an instrument, perhaps a trumpet, a French horn, something brass. But in the next room over, I hear a mother and a young child. And the mother is saying, patty cake, patty cake. And the child is saying, patty cake, patty cake. And then the mother <laughs> says, no, come, come, come. But back in the kitchen, in the drain, there was something I overlooked. The drain was blocked. It, it looks like an ace bandage. It's the sort of thing that you wrap around your knee. And this is how I'm going to know what my speech is. <laughs> we open the door, the Book of Concord, Concordia, three numbers, 800, on the mantle, do you remember it? A statue of Columbus, Columbia, and then the sewer, a knee, a brass instrument, and the baby saying, cup, Concordia, 800, <laughs> Columbia, sewer, Nebraska. Oh, that was how I was going to remember the address. <laughs> so again, it was, it was Socrates who got me into this mess. He said, don't write anything down. It's a crutch for a week well, we front line. Come to think of it, he's a convicted felon. <laughs> I should never take his advice. I really like writing. <laughs> And, and in fact, every word of my presentation is written out in a Zimmer's handout, which means I'm ready for your questions. <laughs> but if you'd like a little bit of time to collect your thoughts, I'll give you some highlights that are in the handout. Did you all receive a handout? I think we have some extras here still, in case anyone needs any of the back. All right, so the handout is four pages. The last page is just a bunch of resources that you can read later in case you have a weak mind and won't remember it. <laughs> and then the other three pages, they're, they're more or less laid out identically. One of them focuses on reading assignments, the other one on writing assignments, and the last one on teaching strategies. And each one has about five or so different approaches with the pros and cons listed. And this is something I developed reflecting upon 20 years of teaching experience at the college level, looking backward, and then looking forward, asking myself, what in the world should we be doing at Luther Classical College? And people keep coming to me and saying, are you going to teach this way? Are you going to teach that way? And I think the answer is yes, we're going to teach lots of different ways. Because as you know as teachers, you have different subject matter for different students at different levels, large classes, small classes, homeschool classes at your dining room table. And each of these will need you to adapt. After all, one definition of rhetoric is to be able to give any speech on any topic to any audience on any occasion. And applied to teaching, that means there's not just a one-size-fits-all formula, but there are advantages and disadvantages to various ways of teaching, whether we're assigning writing or assigning reading 
or thinking about teaching methods in general. So the first page here, types of great book reading assignments. And we could assign the whole work, we could assign abridgments, we could assign small excerpts, we could have secondary or tertiary sources instead of the real McCoy. All of these are possible and each of these has some advantages and disadvantages. Let me ask you, what do you prefer to do? And if you could tell us, you know, who you're serving. Is it younger or older students? Is it a one-room schoolhouse? Is it graded? Is it a homeschool at your kitchen table? Any strong preference in terms of what kinds of reading assignments that you would give? Yes? Uh, in older grades, obviously it depends on what I'm doing. If I'm doing Bible, I don't want to do a bridge of words. You know, I want to use the whole thing. But whereas it might be something where it's very complex, I might want to use excerpts because I want to get the key points of those pieces. Okay, so part of it is your goal, right? You, you, you start with where you want them to end. You start with where you want them to end, and then you say, how do we get them there? And if it's complicated, if it's overwhelming, you break it down, you find excerpts, you find summaries. But on the other hand, like you said, if these are more mature students, the goal is to place in their hands the Holy Scriptures and have them read the whole thing, right? Okay, any other suggestions along those lines? Or any questions? Have any of you struggled with these decisions of, what should I sign for my students to read? How much or how little? I've struggled with that. We receive all kinds of suggestions of what should go into the curriculum. And I said, thank you, that's a great idea. Where will it fit? <laughs> and so we find ways to trim. So sometimes our students at college will read the whole work because I think that's just the best way to know it inside and out. But other times, I think you can get 99% of value by reading 80%. I don't think there should be any shame in reading less of it. They can always read the rest later. We don't have to be utter perfectionists. And then at the other extreme, sometimes you do have a summary rather than the actual work. That can be helpful in the early stages of research. That can be helpful at the younger grades. That can be helpful for a variety of reasons. I'd like you to look at number two. One thing I would like to talk about would be one of the advantages of abridging words. It says, for brevity, for simplicity, and for purity. For brevity, for simplicity, and for purity. So brevity is, oh, there's just too many pages to read. We don't have enough time today. We don't want to overwhelm them. For simplicity, cut to the chase, highlight the really important parts, the pivotal parts where they're going to find the main points, or where they're going to find something that's interesting that you want to discuss. You know, so you set the stage for class discussion by assigning that. Also for purity, thinking of Ephesians, that it's shameful even to mention what the wicked do in secret. Or the more positive way of saying it from Philippians, that whatever is true, noble, just, pure, lovely, a good report, whatever is virtuous, think on these things. And so I think one thing we have to be cautious about is that we remain Lutheran first in classical setting. There's plenty of gross and disgusting stuff in the classical literature from the pagans. There's much good that we can glean, and sometimes we do expose our students to evil in that content, but we can do it in smaller doses, in doses that are not going to be vivid and excite their imagination toward temptation. It's not that we're avoiding sinful content, because then you wouldn't have your students read the whole Bible, would you? The Bible mentions sin, it portrays sin, it talks about sin, it also judges sin, it puts sin in context. And so we can be thankful for the times when pagan works, by, by virtue of Romans chapter 2, that the, the work of God's law is written in their hearts too, that they also deal with sin, with evil, but they deal with it in the right context. I'm thinking of Aristotle's Ethics, which our own book of Concord praises, for saying that as far as civil righteousness goes, a relationship to each other this side of heaven, not trying to please God, not earning your salvation, but just how do we get along on this earth, Melanchthon writes that Aristotle's ethics is about as good as it gets. And he's got that idea of moderation between two extremes, but he's also clear that there are some things where it's not a matter of moderation. Aristotle mentions twice, for example, that adultery is not one of those things where you want to commit a moderate amount of adultery, not too much or too little. He says, no, that's just categorically wrong. Right? 
And so the way that evil is portrayed in Aristotle's ethics is at least close to biblical. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's close enough that, that I think we can read that with minimal risk of harm, right? As compared to some other more vivid descriptions that you might try and say in some of the poetry of Ovid. That's where we want to be brief, be simple, and especially be pure. Thinking partly of the age group and maturity of the people we're serving, but also just thinking that we all remain children of God the rest of our lives. It's not like now I'm old enough to go watch an X-rated movie. We, we never reach that. That's, that's a false view from the world. And so maturity means now we're ready for all that horrible stuff. Some of us, there's, there's no good reason for any of this. Any of this except perhaps to quickly skim and say, let's skip those pages. And then we read it enough to know to protect others from it. So that's where I think we can be thankful for each other. We can be thankful for Memoria Press. We can be thankful for these other groups out there that are cultivating a subset from the classical world and saying, now, which of these things can we deploy as Christians in a way that's helpful to those who have any of you uh, changed your teaching over the years? Have you thought, I'll assign this, and then later you, you say that was too much or that was not enough? I'm just thinking of the quantity now, perhaps, you know, that it either overwhelmed them or that you abridged it so much that they, they didn't have enough context and they were kind of lost. Would anyone like to share an example that can help others learn from your example? wasn't treating um, blindness or the problem of blood as a sin. In fact, they knew the name. But in the age where I had to go to have the children to go down, and they didn't really understand the sense of it, and you know what that kind of a sense that he was making. And that, that was good for them. I think getting the vocabulary early helps them to grow spiritually. And you, you mentioned reading level. That's an important consideration, too, because depending on whether we have the students read it alone by themselves, or whether we read it aloud, or there's kind of a middle ground of you might fall on people. You know, you read a paragraph, you read a paragraph, you read a paragraph, I lead a class discussion. That the reading level that you assign needs to be proportionate to those kinds of expectations. Research shows that reading aloud to children is the great equalizer. You know, there's a lot of talk about socioeconomic background, about ethnicity, about all of these like patterns that you can run statistics and figure out who finishes high school and who gets into college and so forth. But the great equalizer across all of those social and economic and racial categories and however else you want to slice and dice the statistics is reading aloud, reading aloud to children. And so we are able to read at a higher level than they are which means we know how to pronounce those words. We have a sense of what those words mean. So as we read aloud, we can have the proper sentence inflection. And they will soak up the new vocabulary by context or by the facial expression we have or any number of things like that. And especially also by repetition. And then likewise, if you assign them to read, you could have them read it on their own and maybe they're supposed to write a paper or whatever. You assume they understand. But if you call on students occasionally to read aloud in class, and I don't just mean second grade when you're expecting that you know, they're all learning in the knee pad. I mean high school, I mean college. I've done this as a college teacher. And, and then sometimes I'm surprised that they didn't know that, where they'd stumble over it. So then you can stop, you can write the, board, the word on the board, you can ask if anyone knows what it means. You know, let the student know not to feel embarrassed. We're all in this together. And in fact, you discovered half the class didn't know what the word meant. And the other half thought they did, and they were wrong. You know, and so then you, you work through that, right? So keep in mind there are a variety of different strategies for assigning works, how long they are, whether it's a primary source, for that matter, whether or not it's in translation. I know many of you are at schools where people are learning Latin, for example, and then in small bite-sized pieces you could give them something that's, you know, in, in the original text in Latin. Any other questions or suggestions regarding reading assignments? Yes? Yeah. 
Okay. What are the advantages and the disadvantages to an abridged classic? And one advantage you were already suggesting in your question was that it exposes them to the basic narrative, right? They, they get the story. And, and that way they can do it earlier than they're able to read the whole thing or even listen to someone else read it. Um, do you see a disadvantage that you'd read it on? Okay, so it, it becomes a spoiler alert situation, right? <laughs> Where they got the storyline uh, in a simplified version and that somehow uh, robs them of the experience that the author initially may have intended for them. Thoughts on that? Yes. So um, I teach senior letters and master's level grades, but I also have a number of children in my home. And um, one of the things that I've noticed is that in telling these stories, especially in things like the Iliad, the Odyssey, and then that, it, it brings back a lot of time in people if they don't have an idea of it. And if they do have an idea of it already, they can talk about those really good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and my own children, because I'm teaching this, have been exposed to like the graphic novel version. Be careful with the Odyssey graphic novel version. <laughs> um, but they've been exposed to versions that contain the story, and they've been telling the story, and so I'm really excited to get them in my classroom when they're older, because I know we're going to be able to talk about the deeper things that are going on with the scenes that I want them to get, because they're not just going to be told the story. And that's why also reading is really fun, right? Because the first time you read really a lot of things, and the second time you read more, and the third time you read more. So I don't think it's harmful if they're exposed to an appropriate age level one at a younger age, and then we can really dig with them and make sure that they understand it. What counts as a classic? There's all kinds of different definitions, but one of them is something that's worth rereading many times anyway. So if that's the case, you know, I wonder what about the, like I want to become a classic author. I'm going to write something that I hope they have to read five times before they understand. It. I think, by and large, the advantage of the simplified versions uh, for younger readers uh, outweigh the disadvantages. I suppose that there's a lot of suspense and surprise if it's a Sherlock Holmes mystery or whatever, and you, you know, want to recreate that that first time, then I'd probably say no. But a lot of these other um, these these great works of literature and philosophy and history and so forth, I think, are great because they have so many lessons. Including that even if you streamline and simplify it, you still have several really good lessons in there that may well be worth um, passing on. I've seen lots of people nod at information, so so far I'm doing good on that answer. Yes? So I would, I would just like to add one small thing to what you just said. This is true for me. They're probably surprisingly there every time you read a good book. You know? <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> or, or like my six-year-old who says, oh, Daddy, this is going to be the good part. <laughs> right, yeah. And back to the example of the Bible, of course, there's an example where God, I think, has always intended that it's being preached to us um, before we're reading it. That, that I, you know, when in history, very few people read the Bible before hearing about it, you know, some other way. So in terms of the greatest book, that's the way we handle that. Um, but again, I, I suppose a few examples of maybe a mystery where there's a surprise ending that you don't want to give away, um, maybe those are worth saving. Sure. Yeah, I can see that. And even on Homer, is it a translation into English prose or a translation into English poetry? And then what forms of English poetry? You've got a number of decisions being made there. And then is it being written to be read silently to oneself or, or written to be read aloud, a text to be performed? 
that also can make a difference um, as to how understandable it will be, as well as to how faithful it might be in some of the exciting imagery that really stirs the imagination of the visual science. Yes? They need to. Is it just a matter of just canceling out the paragraphs, or is it is it kind of rewriting as well? So first of all, in Cliff Notes, my experience has been it's harder to understand those things than the actual work itself. <laughs> it's like overwhelming with all these details, turn it out, too many things at once. Um, but who does the bridging? You know, it can depend so much, and so I think um, you know it depends. How, how far bridged it is to a trial level and so forth. But often there is a, a shortening of the story with fewer details as and a simplification of language, both at the level of sentence structure and vocabulary um, is involved. So. There's no rewriting. Mm -hmm. There can be, you know, and, and of course, you know, then you've got that phrase artistic license and whether it's betraying the author's original intent. It seems like a lot of, uh, there's a lot of parallels <coughs> Yeah, translated to the second grade. Yeah. And also, I think it's important. I mean, they are apparently very helpful, but they're a precursor rather than a substitute. You know what I'm saying? Don't ever read the primary text. Right. It takes a lot to chip away at it, and it also needs to explain it. Right. In the second grade. Right. So I think we can perhaps best understand this thinking of the analogy of Bible history. Right? You get these Bible history books which at their best are simply a shortening and simplifying of Holy Scripture presented in small enough chunks that you can you know, read a section a day or whatever. But through that, you will become familiar with truth from Holy Scripture that will be building for your faith, right? Uh, the disadvantage would be someone asked whether the story ever gets changed. You know, where you get to the Lord's Supper in these Zondervan Bible history ones, and it says, and then the Lord said, this, this represents my body or something, right? <laughs> And, then, and we've had to do the magic marker on those and, and make them be the way the Bible put it. Uh, or, or hopefully the one from CPH is better and so forth. But I think the wrestling that many of us have done as parents with things like Bible history books is, is largely parallel to what we would do as teachers, whether homeschool parents or in a school, in terms of finding simplified children's versions that ideally are a stepping stone toward what they can read in high school and college rather than a substitute, but at least an entrance into that great discussion in that way. Yes? Uh, as a homeschool parent with no classical background, if I was your least learner, in a sense, that back in how we should approach it with our seventh grade, I never read the Odyssey before trying to get ready for this year. Sure. So, it's impossible without the background. I mean, many well-trained learners go through this writing process. Right, right. Yeah, so I would say there's no harm in just reading it together and just telling your children, look, I'm reading this the first time. I've heard that it's great from lots of people whom I know and trust. I, I wish I had read it before, but let's try it. So that's one option. The other would be for you to find a couple of simplified versions, quick read those to at least get your bearings. <laughs> and, and then as you read the full one you know, with your children, then you can say, hey, I remember this was in the other thing. I think it's going to be important. Let's watch for it. You know, uh, And I don't think there's any harm in being transparent. I think we're in a room full of people who all wish we were classically educated. I know everyone at Luther Classical College says we want to go to the college as students, <laughs> but first we have to make it for the other people, and it's kind of too late for us. But I, I think that's a very common feeling. Um, and I only read Homer just like, I don't know, three, four years ago, and they still let me stand up. So I think it's going to be okay. <laughs> all right, let's move to the next page. This is on writing assignments. And here I've got a variety of strategies, again, that I've used, each with, I think, advantages and disadvantages. One of them is daily study questions, which really, I think, speaks to those last points. Giving your, your students something to anticipate. Why are you reading this? Here's something to look for. So the helpful thing about that is that they at least have some clue and some context of what might be important. 
The disadvantages of that include several things. It can just be tedious. They're busy work. You can end up with these stilted study questions that don't actually fit the text for your child's imagination. <laughs> and so a lot of times I've found if I borrow someone else's curriculum, look at this, we have ready-made study questions. I can't figure out the answers to those. That's why I wrote my own, because then I can answer them. No. But I mean, I think we have different personalities and we come to the text with different priorities. And, and I think some of these companies, honestly, are in the business of selling study questions rather than making sure that their study questions actually you know, work. And so um, anyway, that's one technique that can be helpful. Related to that is keeping a commonplace notebook. How many of you do that? How many of you heard about it earlier today in another session? It came up in another session, at least one other session. Um, something I've done off and on, and that's where you, you keep a little notebook and you write down quotations or other little insights that you learn from things you're reading, and then you can start to connect. And I think that connecting gives us new ways to ask questions, too, because now you're comparing what two different works or three different works uh, say, and of course, connecting things back to scripture. What would God have us to understand about this issue that's going on in this other work? That's always uh, something to have at center stage. And then moving down some of these other types of writing assignments, you can have students give reports on a common reading that everyone does. That's number two. Or else you can assign distinct readings to different members of the class. And then each of them give a report concerning what they read, but their classmates have not read. So then the classmates get the benefit of at least absorbing some highlights from what their, their classmates said in the unique thing that their classmate read, um, even though they have not done all the reading. So it exposes everyone to, to a broader array of things. And, and of course, there are advantages. Sometimes we want to be exposed to a broad array of things just to soak up more. But other times, we all want to read the same thing in common and focus very specifically and go deeper. Pros and cons to both of those. And I do mention over here in the disadvantages, there's also the, the risk that the student will do a poor job in preparing that presentation to classmates. And then that can be a waste of time for everyone. You know, who wants to pay their tuition to have some other, you know, ignorant young person be their teacher? <laughs> so, so the way out of that is to provide enough scaffolding. And I've done this at the college level. I think you can adjust it for whatever level you're at. And it can be, sometimes I got just very didactic. Uh, teaching a class on the U.S. Supreme Court, I had students brief a case, which is what attorneys still do. And there's a couple different ways to do that, but I mean, the main idea is, is you say, what was the issue at stake in this case, and what did the judge or the jury decide, why? And, and, and then you kind of list a few bullet points, and it's a very you know, succinct way of, of knowing, like, what's the take-home lesson from that court decision? Yeah, you know. Well, I broke it up into about 10 steps. You know, step number one was cite the case. There's a particular way to have the citation that lets people know, you know, which page number in the volume of U.S. reports, for example, does the official Supreme Court decision, you know, get cataloged. And, and there's a, there, you have to have your comma in the right place and things like that. So it's very simple. It's a one-liner, but you've got to get it right. And that's 10 points. Cite the case, you know. And then, and then who are the parties? So it's going to be so-and-so versus so-and-so. And you would put their names, but then in parentheses, you might, you know, say something about their station in life, like, you know, how they got in that. And then you get to the issue where it's like a one or two sentence summary. And then uh, I think my next thing was, you know, which part of the Constitution? Maybe it's a 14th Amendment issue or a First Amendment issue or something like that. So you'd mention that. And then we worked our way down to what was the majority court decision. But then sometimes there's a minority opinion that challenges the majority. And if so, uh, then you would, you'd say what they said and quickly the basis of why. And again, like just one paragraph. So the whole thing was about a page, two pages max. The last one, this was my favorite one, it kind of goes back to a commonplace notebook. I said, find some clever quotation that was in the Supreme Court ruling and, and put that down. Because sometimes there's just these great one-liners uh, in there. And they're, they're witty, they're fun. I mean, it's not always dry legal stuff. It could be great literature. Uh, one of them I remember was a, a pig in the parlor is the right kind of thing, but in the wrong place. It had to do with zoning regulations. Right? You know, another one was like a, a tax on the because it was a tax on Jews. It's like all these just clever little witty things like that. And they make these cases uh, more memorable. And so we put that at the end too. It's very robotic because I tell them, they, they actually have the number, like number one, citation colon. The citation had to be in bold. And then right after that, you put your citation. Number two, and, and then on, on we go, what? 
after they had done several of them themselves that they share with the class, and then others in the class who read different cases, wrote theirs and made enough copies for everyone and shared theirs. By the end of the semester, you had written several of these, you had read 50 of these, we had had class discussions about them, and you know right where to go to find the meat of it because they're all in the same format. You go on autopilot, which is a good thing. Because one thing we do as classical educators is we give people a model of excellence so they can imitate a model of excellence. And I will just stand here and tell you that my model is excellence. I'm not saying it's the only model. I happen to have 10 steps. You could do it in eight, you could do it in 12, you could switch the order, I don't really care. There are probably half a dozen really, really good ways to do it. I chose one that we stuck with it the whole semester long. And the result is they internalize that thought process and off they go to law school and then become lawyers and they're writing codes. And I did check with lawyers to make sure I was you know, connecting the dots. <laughs> And you can do the same thing with, say, a five-paragraph essay, or maybe even a house of memory, or <laughs> whatever you want. But give them a simple model, and it, and it could be, of course, a lot shorter than the example I gave if we're talking second grade instead of college. Um, but, you know, it could be summarize the main point, and now pose a question. So it could be your two steps. And everyone always summarizes, and they ask. What's your summary? What's your question? You know, that, that would be a great way to launch a class discussion, real simple like that. And you, you can come up with any number of other models like that. I want to mention, too, that when it comes to number three, these reports on supplementary reading, one of the things that we're planning to do at the college level, especially for years three and four, is to depart from having common readings in the classes, but rather to have individual readings. And especially when we get to, oh, the last few hundred years. I think it's really to go back, way back when, and everyone agrees these are the handful of books everyone should read. So we'll have everyone read. But when you get, especially say the last 200 years, there's just way too much for one person. But if I could say each student has to read, let's say, four books, like one book a month, you're going to read that, and you're going to make a two page handout, and you're going to give a five minute oral presentation. And then after that, fellow next to you will do the same thing. We'll have three or four students do that. And, and there goes the first, let's say, half hour of class, whatever it takes. And then we open it up for discussion. So what we've done is we have five people who have followed a model, or four people, whatever it was, a model of excellence that outlines it in a real succinct way that gets to the meat of it. They've all brought that out on the table. They can start asking each other questions. Oh, well, the book I read said this. Would your book agree or disagree? And then someone else who's in the audience not reporting that day can now ask the panelists further questions. And someone can say, well, I remember two weeks ago I read that other thing and I was talking about this. It sounds like your thing is kind of like it, but not exactly the same. What do you think your author would say about? And now we brought it all together into a discussion. I would not do this at the kindergarten level. <laughs> <laughs> I won't do it the first week of college. But I think by years three and four, they'll be ready because we have little steps along the way. And you know, there's that old debate about whether you should be the sage on the stage or the guy from the sign, right? Mm -hmm. By the time they graduate, I think our professors should become a little more of a guide on the sign. Not in that postmodern sense of, well, just let the students do whatever they feel is special, but rather we've equipped them enough so that they're able to become the next generation of teachers as they graduate. So that's where I see um, number, number three really leading. And you can be a piece of that as well, anywhere from you know, preschool on upward in those little baby steps along the way. Questions or comments about what kind of writing assignments to use, or maybe, maybe problems, maybe you've tried something and it backfired and you want to share that because we're here to help you. Someone's pointing, is there? Oh, over here, yes. Yes. Excellent question, right? So I, I would advise, um, when you're not sure the students are trustworthy enough to do a good job, evaluate themselves to know that they're ready, and then present it to classmates in a way that's helpful to the class. Start off with those smaller steps and have them write something or even present something one-on-one 
to you, and then you can give them feedback, and then pre prepare them so that then they're ready to give something that's helpful to the class. Absolutely. Yes. Is this time on the transcript reading writing process that we address proficiency without pressuring them to be readers? Sure. Yeah, so how to grade writing um, without without crushing students, um, but but finding out areas that should be improved and, and ways to improve. It begins on what I what I assign to them. And over the years I shifted much like I was describing before to a more robotic prescribed outline. You know, one assignment I used to give was to write a book review. Maybe I'd say, you know, write a book review, it should be so many words or so. Um, be sure that you identify strengths and weaknesses or something like that in the author's words. But not a whole lot of guidance, and the really good students did a really good job. Maybe they had read other book reviews, maybe they just thought the way I thought, I don't know, they, they knew what to do. And other students, they'd submit something that was, I'm not sure they really summarized what the author was saying, and then and the next step would be to evaluate and find strengths and weaknesses, you know. So then I broke it down. And I actually said, paragraph one, you introduce the author in the book. And, and I gave them a few more pointers of how to do that. You know, how to begin in such a way that, that imagines an audience and draws them in and says, I'd like to talk to you about this author who wrote this book. And that's paragraph number one. And then paragraph number two, uh, state the main points of the book, the thesis, whatever you want to call it. And then paragraph three was summarize some of the, I'm thinking of nonfiction in this case, this is history class three, some of the evidence that the author gave in favor of, say, his interpretation of World War II, right? And so then you've got the, the evidence. And then we move more into critiques and, and uh, you know, strengths and weaknesses and how might the author would, how might the author respond if you presented that critique to the author, right? And then towards the end, what was the overall significance? You know, in other words, maybe it was a book about World War II, but does it reveal something about justice or liberty or one of these enduring, you know, ideas that we like to talk about. And so I actually broke it down paragraph by paragraph, which part of me thought is too stifling because they're college students, they should just be able to do their thing. But I actually found that it was liberating to the students because it, it gave them enough structure so they weren't lost. So that even a struggling student who had a weak high school background could get into the game. And then those who already were really good writers, they could then focus on some of the rhetorical flourish and sense as well. And, and anyway, your question had to do with grading, but I said I started with revising my assignment. Now that that's my assignment, it became very easy. Does paragraph one identify the author and the book, yes or no? And then does, does it do it well, you know? And so very easily I could decide if, if they get between zero and 10 points and the paragraph is missing, they get zero. If it's a clear paragraph that draws the reader in and says, yep, this is the book and here's the author and a little bit maybe about the author's background, or this, this was the third book in a series, or you know, some little tidbit like that that seems appropriate, you get a 10, and I move on. It made it faster for me to grade, too, because I'm just kind of looking for very specific things. Again, the disadvantage is it becomes too mechanical and robotic, but I actually found that, to the contrary, it gave enough structure that students could, could really succeed in it, and then I could write something in the margin right next to that point. And then, uh, you know, I might say, well, the, say the paragraph on evidence. In the case of a, a history class, we're looking for what kind of evidence did the author have for why he thought World War II went the way it was or whatever. I would say, well, did he quote any, uh, you know, World War II generals or whatever? I could ask a follow-up question that would directly speak. So by application for the rest of you who may be teaching other subjects and at other levels, I think if you break it into small enough pieces, you teach them each piece at a time, then you can also give them feedback when grading and say, here's where you're strong, here's where you're strong, here's where you're weak, here's an idea to do it better next time. And then ideally, if you do have repeat assignments, you can even track to see if they improve. All right, that would be great book writing assignments. And then teaching strategies is on the next page. And this really ranges from a full lecture where you've got an entire hour and the professor talks and the students take notes 
all the way down to number five, where the students are actually leading the discussion. And I've stated some advantages and disadvantages of each. My favorite approaches over the years have been number two, the mini lecture, where I may talk for five, ten minutes, explain something, got a map up, whatever, uh, pointing to the map, pointing to the text, but then I pause and I take questions or I pause and I call on students and I say, okay, I gave you those study questions when you did your reading. Let's look at question number two. What do you have for question number two? And, and I would embed the study questions in the course of several mini lectures, you know, plan it out that I'm gonna present for 10 minutes, give some context, call on them with study question number two that went with their reading and fits with where I just was and leads to where I wanna go next. And one of the advantages of that is that then I get a lot of feedback from the students to know, because if I just, stand up and talk for an hour, I don't know how much they're understanding. But if I'm engaging them, then I hear from them. On the other hand, there's this disadvantage of engaging the students too much and saying ridiculous things, such as, every opinion is equally valued. Let's hear all of your opinions. Okay, every person was created in God's image and redeemed by his son. There's equal value there. Okay, everyone in this room is of equal value to the son of God, if you think about the great exchange. But that doesn't mean that every thought or every opinion should be equally valued in our discussion. And so we, we need to evaluate those, often by comparing them against the assigned text to find out whether it makes sense to say that in relation to what these words mean, right? And there, that's where we want to spur each other on toward what we call the good, the true, and the beautiful here at CCLE, right? And so your discussion, as you include more and more participation from the class, you always want it to be direction, right, with that in mind. And again, not that I understand Homer's Odyssey perfectly or anything else, but that we're on a shared journey and I can at least carry it and, and as your students mature and understand things more and more on their own, they will have great insights. And you as a teacher will have that aha moment and you'll say, well, I never thought about it that way, but I think you're on to something. And that can be exciting too. But we just want to make sure that our interchange is purposeful and that is directional leading toward that. So mini lecture I often use together with prepared study questions. Student-led discussions, again, much like the student-led presentations that we talked about before. It takes, first of all, the teacher guiding them one step at a time and building them up with that. And secondly, it takes them being ready to be built up to that. So you probably don't do this at the preschool level too much, except for like a little bit of chill and tell. Um, but that can get long. <laughs> But I think especially by the college level, and especially in certain classes, with the right preparation, it can be very valuable to them and to their classmates, and also very rewarding for you. I'd like to talk for a few minutes about Socratic questioning, and then I can take any more of your own questions. And so continuing the theme I was just on, that, that not all opinions should just be voiced and we say, oh, thank you, we're so glad to have so many different opinions. Socratic questioning is not simply teaching by asking questions. Sometimes people mistakenly think so. It's by asking a certain kind of question with a certain purpose of heading something. And so uh, it's not simply that I ask questions and then the students give answers and then we must have used the Socratic method. Rather, we want to ask clarifying questions that help people think more carefully, second guess things that we thought were right, evaluate to find out whether that really is true, test it to see how broadly applied that truth can be and hope that at the end we have filtered out some error and we've honed in on a good direction to go. And even if we haven't found the answer, have we at least gotten closer there? So a big example of this would be in Plato's Republic, and we can compare that also to the book called Politics by, by Aristotle. And so both of them have something in common, like what's a good form of government to have? Right? That's one of the questions that we're asking. But then along the way, you can ask a lot of follow-up questions to them. And so, you know, Plato, for example, or Socrates as a mouthpiece, whatever, um, you know, they're gonna say democracy is a bad thing and having philosopher kings is the way to go, right? Well, if that's the case, how do we know that the philosopher kings will, will do a good job? Well, we have to make sure they're trained well. What kind of training should they have? In fact, there's a whole section in there on education of some kind, because it's follow-up questions. And although Aristotle doesn't pursue it in the way he writes it out with a question-answer dialogue like what we find with Plato, 
you can in class very much do the same thing. So Aristotle has a different approach. Instead of saying that we should have a philosopher king at the top and everyone else should just kind of do what the really smart people say, he says in some societies the best fit is to have a monarch. In other societies, the best fit is to have a handful of people and aristocracy be those who govern. And in still other societies, a more democratic form of government would be the best fit for that society because culture matters. And he says each of these three have pitfalls. You know, the, the monarch can end up being a tyrant. The aristocracy could end up becoming an oligarchy, the rule of the few for their own self-interest rather than for the interest of society as a whole. And likewise, the democracy, that can just be chaos of, of everyone just trying to get their own piece of the pie, uh, rather than all of us contempt contemplatively making decisions together as a group, which would be you know, better ideal. And so basically, there's a pro and con to each of those three forms of government, which of course, if you're now having a class discussion, you could say, well, do you agree with this? And how would Aristotle, you know, what would he say if he could talk to, to Socrates? And, and are you sure? Because Aristotle seems more open to democracy, although it's not necessarily his favorite either, whereas Socrates was very averse to it. So why is it? And what do you think and why? And if Aristotle is right, part of his answer was that you have a different form of government that fits a different kind of society, in which case, what fits our society? And now that raises the question, what, what fits our society today as compared to 250 years ago when the Constitution was being written? And so now you've opened up a lot of questions. They don't necessarily have a fixed answer. It's not like mathematics where you always get to either one answer or sometimes two. You know, square root of four is plus or minus two, right? <laughs> so there could be a little bit of flexibility in mathematics. But it's also not the case that anything goes. You can't just throw out something and, and have an unfounded opinion and feel that now we've got everyone to participate equally so we deserve brownie points. But rather, there are questions that lead to other questions, and there are questions that, that help steer us away from pitfalls that were just identified. So we're moving the conversation forward in this shared journey toward the good, the true, and the beautiful. And just as Aristotle said, you can have any of those three forms of government, and they can work out well, but they all have pitfalls. So also, I think, the same is true with your teaching strategies, with the reading strategies, and with the writing strategies. There are advantages and disadvantages to each. We have about 10 minutes left for further questions and comments. So I invite your discussion. Yes? What do you think about early on participation? Is it something that can be quite appealing to some people who are just maybe acquiring the field of history or they don't understand how they can you know, they can be a different kind of person or a different kind of feeling? Like they already think they know what it is or they've seen it all the time or they don't think it's as large as they think it is or they just kind of buy it. Do you think that's a good tactic? So if we're going to be Socratic, I have to ask, what's the point of grading to begin with? Right? What is this thing called grading, and, and why do we have it, and why do we do it? And I think that will help answer your question. And so um, you know, one reason we grade is to know whether you did well enough in this class to be ready for the next one. Another reason we grade is to know whether you did well enough in all these classes to get a diploma, with a presumption that getting a diploma is your ticket to do some other thing in life. Now, these things aren't laid out in quite a perfect alignment, but I, I think that's the general uh, idea. But we can also have those, that, that would be more summative grading. In other words, at the end of the course, did you finish the course well enough to go on to the next course? But there's also formative grading or formative assessment. So halfway along, do I as your teacher think you're doing well? And if not, it might be my fault for not teaching you well enough. So let me think of a different way to help you get that. And so I think the formative assessment is really key. So one thing I would recommend is to have some kind of graded thing, whether it counts or not in the grade book, we'll come back to that. But, but right away, your first couple weeks for every class, figure out where every student is, okay? And so there are a variety of ways to do that. One way is that as I'm talking, a number of you are doing all these nonverbal things. I'm seeing the smiling and the nodding, I'm seeing the, oh, I'm gonna take a note of that. Uh, and so that helps me to know whether you're following along at least in general. And there it doesn't show up in the grade book, but that's already part of this feedback, right? But the other thing we could do is with quiz, I could ask you, uh, real simple, I could say, write down the most important thing you learned in this section, and then write down the, the muddiest point, you know, the, the most confusing thing. 
And if I had each of you do that, it took all of four minutes, I'd collect it. I don't have to put it in the grade book necessarily, but at least I had the sense of you were there, you had something written down that was on topic with what I talked about, which means you didn't zone me out completely. And then it also gives me feedback of, oh, well, if 17 out of 30 students all thought that was the main point, and that wasn't my goal at all, then the problem could be over here, or at least 17 of 30 times. <laughs> so I'd say all of that is really background now to your question. Right? So I think if participation means do they come to class, do they bring their book, are they raising their hand at least some of the time, when I call on them cold, are they ready at least some of the time? I think that should be part of their grade. Um, because at the formative level, that shows me they're in the game to have a fighting chance of getting something out of the class, right? And if they're not doing any of those things, then either they already know it from prior knowledge, in which case they don't really need the class, or else uh, they're just gonna be tail spinning for the best. I think that going to school also does something else, and I think college degrees um, have come to mean this in America, that whatever your degree is in, at least you graduate from college and now you can go get a so-called real job, so-called, I don't mean to be offensive, I'm just saying that's how we're kind of the society that's built that way. I think part of it is that you, you survived four years. You know, you showed up, you jumped through the hoops, you played the game, and welcome to the real adult world where we have to jump through a lot of hoops to play the game. And so it's predictive of an employee who will show up on time rather than skip work if they also showed up at class. And so I think that part of grading is like that just because it's part of college is connected to that uh, servile as well as the liberal arts world. That helps. So with all of that put together, it's going to vary, I think, on the kind of class. How much is attendance and participation? How much is effort? How much is achievement? And how each of those gets demonstrated whether it's through reading, through writing, through oral presentation, uh, through raising your hand to volunteer, through being willing to be called upon cold. And, uh, and, and there's no simple formula for the right ratio, but I think that's where faculty talking with each other too, to double check their ideas. And that's, in my career, that's been very helpful. If I was trying this in my class, what do you do in your class and why? And then you end up finding the sweet spot that fits that grade level and that subject matter. I've never had that problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I do call on people cold. One thing, I tend to make a seating chart right away. That way I get everyone's name and I can just, or, you know, and, and, and I tell them the first day that I'm going to teach. Because that can also be rather intimidating. Um, but, and especially in a large group like this too. Um, but, but one thing I do is I do like to, one of my goals is to call on every student every week. I can't always do it every day depending on the class size. But every student at least once a week to give them a chance to participate. Sometimes if I know it's a student who's struggling, I'll give them an easier question. Sometimes it's been someone who came to my office to work on an aspect, and so I know they're down ready on that. And so I'll, I'll give that to them as an easy one. Because sometimes the issue, issue is they're shy, they, they don't feel confident, and so I want to give them a, a way to succeed in front of their peers. And so sometimes I've quite intentionally structured it that way. Um, other times it's more apathy on, on their part. So sometimes I talk to them during office hours. I find out what else is going on in their life. I find out where my course ranks in their, you know, their list of priorities in their life. Sometimes I've told them, um, you know, I said, look, I don't have to be the most important person in your life. I'm not saying this course has to be taught. But what I am saying, and this is more for the college world, I am saying, welcome to the adult world where you're going to make a decision about you know, how many hours a week you're gonna work and whether or not you're gonna have a girlfriend and whether or not this is a class in your major or not in your major. Because you know, sometimes they've told me that, I don't really need this class except for gen ed, so then it doesn't matter. Um, you know, the great thing about losing class at the college is 80% was gen ed. <laughs> they all matter. But, but, but I, you know, I find out why it is that they aren't really engaged in my class. And, um, and then I try to address that. But sometimes at the college level, I've had to say, listen, you, you can't do everything. The world has lied to you and told you you can do anything you want. You actually can't. There's only so many hours in the day. There's only so much energy. 
sometimes I've advised them to drop my class or I'd talk them through and may maybe there's a different class you should drop. Let's go talk to your advisor. You can talk with me if you want. We'll prioritize. You won't offend me if it's mine that has to be dropped. I want to do what's best for you. So where does this fit in relation to your goals in life and your paying tuition? I want you to get your money's worth and all that. So there's no one size fits all answer to come back and summarize. But I have had those kinds of discussions. Now, I think those of you who are teaching elementary school, you know, you can't necessarily have them drop the class or, or, or whatever. It's a different thing. But you can talk to parents at home. You can talk to other teachers who might have them for other subjects. And then you figure out what really is limiting the student and how do we best show up to the student in that context. So that would be my general advice. And then the details would follow on what you discover in that process. Yes. Yeah, on the part you have about writing it on the on the, the group uh, text, mm -hmm. um, this has not come up here, but it's coming up at the seminary level. What do we do about AI? Is there a place for AI? I mean, I I I shut my mouth off and say that I don't like it at all because you just can use a computer to. Um, you know, cut and paste and, and condense. <laughs> you don't even have to write that. You just have the, the box do that. So is there a place for AI at all um, in, in people that are teaching here? And if so, what are your thoughts about that? I'd like to know. Sure. So first of all, I agree with you. I don't like it. Yeah. And then we have to ask ourselves, well, why, why don't we like it? And do we have good reason not to like it? And what should we do about it? Um, yeah, thank you. I actually presented some similar material recently, and, and someone during the, the break asked the same question, and I realized I really need to make another page that would be, you know, are there advantages and disadvantages to different uses of AI? So first of all, let's get rid of the term AI. I think it's a misnomer. You know, artificial intelligence, I guess we could equivocate on what we mean by intelligence. But perhaps we mean like computer-assisted stuff. Let's just call it that. Computer-assisted stuff. So I make multiple words. Um, the, because, you know, I have taught a course on philosophy of mind, and there's this whole thing of can computers really think, and can people really think, and all of that. But how many of us use the spell check? How many of you, us use a digital calculus? And so if we give examples of that, how many of us type rather than handwrite, and so forth? There are advantages and disadvantages to each of these. And so I think, let's take the example of the electric calculator. When you're teaching math facts, and you're doing those, uh, those multiplication tables and all that, and you hand it out to the second graders and it's timed, and I think we still do that because it's good to memorize facts, right? Grammar mistake for math. Don't let them use a calculator. But I think if you're in a high school class and the class is physics, and you want to focus on the experimental design and testing of a hypothesis and some physics stuff, then it might make sense to just use a calculator to make it be a lot faster to get the arithmetic done so you can focus on the physics. I said might be, because you also still might have a good reason to have them do it by hand. I mean, that's going to be your decision as a teacher, right? But I think that that's one of the questions you'll ask yourself by knowing when you want them to use the calculator or not. I tend to turn spell checker off, so I hope you didn't find me. But that's because I tend to use big words that aren't in the spell checker, and I don't want to keep adding to the dictionary. Grammar checker is even worse. I think it's because I, I think my grammar is usually right. It's just more complicated. I don't know. It's because I play Latin. I guess. So. But I do type a lot. And my wife and I reluctantly became smartphone people when our dumb phones weren't allowed to be used anymore in that carrier, and they told us we had to upgrade. So sometimes I even text. <laughs> Coming back to AI, um, I was, I was uh, at a meeting of some pastors in, in Montana, and they were wrestling with it, applied to the ministry. Could you use AI to write your sermons? And their answer was no. And I thought their answer was very good. They understood what the office of the ministry is, as a caretaker of souls, as a shepherd of a specific flock. And so, although some of it is mechanical, like what does the text mean? Can I make sure I have both law and gospel in my sermon? Is there a QC example to use? Probably not that, I'm cheating. <laughs> but, but then out comes a sermon, right? It's like a little sermon factory. But did AI receive a call to be God's shepherd to that people? No. And I think now by analogy, we can say something similar to the dads and moms who are homeschoolers. 
to the teachers, to brick and mortar schools, at the online schools as well, who are really unions for technology to use it carefully. And finally, to the students. You know, did God create you in, in his own image and then call you to take all these shortcuts? Or do these shortcuts shortchange whom God made you to be? If we start with that question, I think it will help us answer that sometimes we might still use a digital calculator and a few other gizmos, but, but we're still going to be cautious. So that would be my outline of how we could begin a Socratic dialogue on that subject some later time if we're out of time. Come to my session tomorrow. I'll address that. Same oh. plug. Go to his session tomorrow. I, I second that. Okay. But I, I think we're about out of time. And so thank you all.